President Xi Jinping opened China's twice per decade Communist Party Congress today with a lengthy list of his achievements during his first five year term and his vision of where he hopes to take his nation. But beyond words, Xi is asserting power like no Chinese leader in decades. William Brangham reports. The applause, the music, it was a reception befitting the commanding role that Xi Jinping has taken since being named party leader five years ago. He opened today's proceedings by hailing reforms he's put in place and proclaiming a, quote, new era for China. The Chinese nation has realized a great leap from declining in modern history to twisting its fate fundamentally and continuously moving to prosperity. Over three and a half hours, Xi laid out his vision to shape the nation of 1.4 billion people into what he called a, quote, great modern socialist country over the next three decades. Achieving the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation will be no walk in the park, and it will take more than drum beating and gong clanging to get there. The whole party must be prepared to make more arduous, strenuous efforts. Susan Shirk is chair of the 21st Century China Center at the University of California, San Diego. Xi Jinping has a vision of China's role in the world that is much more ambitious uh, than anything we have seen before. Talking about China kind of moving toward the center of the world and having a lot more influence than it did before. In his address, Xi largely ignored the question of political reforms in China, and he didn't mention President Trump or North Korea's nuclear weapons program. But in a rare move, he did acknowledge that with global demand weakening, there were challenges facing China's export-driven economy. While China's overall productive forces have significantly improved, and in many areas our production capacity leads the world, the more prominent problem is that our development is unbalanced and inadequate. Xi was one of the first foreign leaders to meet with President Trump. The relationship developed by President Xi and myself, I think, is outstanding. That was decidedly warmer than Mr. Trump's past criticism of China and its economic and trade policies. But other U.S. officials are more critical of Beijing's actions. China, while rising alongside India, has done so less responsibly. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson today criticized China's aggressive displays of economic and military power, particularly its expansion on man-made islands in the South China Sea. We will not shrink from China's challenges to the rules-based order. And where China subverts the sovereignty of neighboring countries and disadvantages the U.S. and our friends. I think there are things to worry about in Chinese foreign policy. They're mostly related to these maritime sovereignty issues and to a kind of bullying in Asia. But the global ambition uh, could turn out to be positive. Susan Shirk says China has filled a vacuum left by the United States withdrawal from global agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Paris Climate Accords. Perhaps the most important thing to watch for in the next few days is who Xi establishes as his likely successor. That's why there's a lot of speculation now that he may be trying, much like Putin, to stay on beyond his normal term or to rule behind the scenes even after he retires. President Trump will be traveling to Beijing to meet Xi next month. During his five years as China's president, Xi Jinping has overseen an era of increased assertiveness and authoritarianism. Well, today, with the confidence of a man who is in full control at home, he is casting his eyes overseas. Speaking at the Communist Party Congress, President Xi unveiled a vision for a new era where China takes center stage in the world. Let's take you to Beijing. Watching the speech for us was our correspondent John Sudworth. Uh, John, what does this new era look like, according to President Xi? Well, we've heard some of it before, of course, Lucy. There are few surprises in these set-piece uh, set speeches at the heart of set-piece events. But essentially, what we heard today was Xi Jinping outline his vision for national rejuvenation, uh, echoing uh, this idea about the Chinese dream, lifting Chinese people to higher levels of prosperity as China rises as a peaceful global superpower. Oh, <laughs>
the rain wasn't the greatest of omens. The Communist Party is meant to be able to control the weather. But inside, nothing could be allowed to dampen the mood. In a speech tinged with nationalism, Xi Jinping struck an optimistic tone and insisted that only the Communist Party could fulfill China's rightful destiny. Let's strive hard to build a wealthy society, achieve the victory of Chinese socialism, realize the Chinese dream of the great rejuvenation and fulfill people's expectations for a better life. While state media carries wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the Congress, the rest of China largely carries on as normal. I have no problem with a rising powerful China, this man tells me. But he adds, I hope one day we too can have democracy. For many, the event is an inconvenience. For days now, Beijing has been in security overdrive, with surveillance stepped up and neighborhood patrols sent out in force. There was once a hope that Mr. Xi would be a political reformer. Instead, he spent his first term in office clamping down on dissent and purging his rivals. And so the world's biggest authoritarian state is confirming its leader in office for another five years. But for China, watches, the interest is not in the system, of course, but the man, seen by many to be accruing more power to himself than any leader since Chairman Mao. At three and a half hours, this was a humdinger of a speech. Even Mr Xi's predecessor, Hu Jintao, touching his watch, appears to signal it could have been, well, a tad shorter. Despite the length, though, you don't have to look hard for the main message. The world's second largest economy will remain firmly under the command of a one-party state. And if anyone had any lingering doubts, Mr Xi has surely now swept them away. It's a pinko party in red China as the Communist Congress gathers in Beijing to grant fake free marketeering President Xi Jinping another five-year term. You thought our president was a blowhard? Xi prattled on for three hours plus about China's greatness and how socialism with Chinese characteristics will save the world. If there's anything great about the Chinese economy and their technology, it's because they've stolen all of our brilliant ideas and trade secrets from needy tech companies who cave to Chinese whims for market share. Our country loses an estimated $600 billion a year through this blatant intellectual property theft. And every time Apple or Amazon caves to Beijing's demands and opens the front door to China's thieves, it gives China an unfair advantage. They've also been engaging in slimy espionage of everything from defense subcontractors to the space shuttle. And they are so desperate to get a leg up, they're willing to amputate ours and glue it on to their own contracting economy. President Xi claims to want free trade, and that is great and glorious if it is truly free. If its grubby pinko fingers are in our national cookie jar, well, their freedom is costing us way too much. We don't need to start a trade war and cripple our economy to teach them a lesson, but we should fortify our cybersecurity, and American companies should grow a pair and stand up to phony baloney Chinese demands of compliance before we are fully castrated by statist robber barons. For more on this, we go to Surab Gupta, policy specialist at the Institute for China-American Studies. Surab, thanks for being here tonight. Let's talk about Xi Jinping first, yes. appointed to another five-year term. How does this work? Uh, it, he is supposed to be appointed to the second, the second term, which is supposed to be his last term. He is a president who has accumulated enormous power and authority in the communist system. And therefore, there is this thinking that he will extend it beyond the five-year term. My inclination is, to th is that he will not do so. He, it is not so much about the Xi Jinping show as much as Xi Jinping being the core leader of a collective leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, which is leading the party and the state and, and the country. A three-and-a-half-hour speech, is that what they normally see in China? I don't think he left anything out. 
let's phrase it this way. This, he is at the pinnacle of his political career. This is that speech delivered at the pinnacle of his political career. It's a work report, and this work report actually has been, has been drawn up over a full year which he delivered. So, how, can, how could he not mention North Korea and the situation on the peninsula and uh, the possibility of nuclear proliferation? I know that's that's important, but I, I don't think he wanted to get into a speech which was particularly adversarial in terms of particularly talking about international issues. He did talk about international issues as to the role of China more broadly in the international system, but he did not touch upon individual issues. He was rather trying to show that he is the heir to Deng Xiaoping, and like Deng Xiaoping did a 30-year program of reform, he is now setting in a similar program for the next 30 years. Let's talk South Korea. Yes. What hindrance if any, does Hillary Clinton provide just showing up and criticizing American policy when, you know, we really don't know what we're dealing with there? You know, it actually doesn't help. And here's the reason why, leave Hillary Clinton aside for a moment, Barack Obama had given a speech in Berlin just before President Trump was getting to Berlin, I think earlier this summer, and he was just trying to show himself the anti-Barack Obama and the anti-Barack Obama policy also. So he needed to frame himself. I mean, Donald Trump needed to frame his this thing on those lines. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what's going to happen. Anything that has come out from a democratic uh, from a democratic side, he is going to reject first of all, even if it has it, if, even if it is at the expense of the hosts. Secondly, on top of that, I think I mean Hillary Clinton shares a, some deal of the blame too in the fact that over the four years when she was Secretary of State and the four years thereafter, I mean, really not that much, not that. Much happened. North Korea says war at any moment. Do you believe that? Should we believe that? No, I don't think we should believe that right away. But the reason for this, I think, I personally think, is because there is, again, a whole set of war games happening right now as we speak on the Korean Peninsula, including strike forces who could decapitate uh, Kim Jong-un. So this was just more of a deterrent threat. Of course, the threat of miscalculation always exists when parties are so, I mean, jostling next yeah. to each other. But what we should definitely be looking for is this providing an excuse for Kim Jong-un to test an intercontinental ballistic missile sometime soon. Hello there, I'm James Bayes. Who is the most powerful person in the world? Many would say the US President Donald Trump, but the international news publication The Economist makes a fair case for arguing it's actually China's president, Xi Jinping. Unlike Trump, the leader of the world's second largest economy doesn't have to worry about Congress, the media, or for that matter, re-election. And although China has had in recent years a collective leadership system, President Xi is feared because of his anti-corruption campaign and has amassed more personal power than any of his recent predecessors. This is a particularly good time to assess all of this. China's ruling party has a major meeting every five years, and it's happening right now. Before we start our discussion, a long-term China watcher, Al Jazeera's Beijing correspondent, Adrian Brown, reports from the Communist Party Congress. President Xi Jinping can control a lot of things, but he can't influence the weather. To the superstitious, and many people here are, the damp grey start to this Congress was perhaps a warning sign. In spite of the weather, this was a day of choreographed unity, after what has been a tumultuous few years for the party. But there was a stirring welcome for the president. This is as close as the foreign media get to the opaque workings of China's Communist Party. She reported on his past five years in office, saying the party had achieved miracles. He also warned serious challenges lay ahead. Our country is at a strategic point in its development. The future is extremely bright, but the challenges are also extremely serious. All party comrades must set their sights far and high and think of danger in times of safety. His address lasted three and a half hours. If nothing else, it showed that she, now 64, is healthy. Healthy enough to rule for another 10 to 15 years, insist his supporters. At one stage, former President Jiang Zemin appeared to nod off. He was China's top leader 25 years ago, when I reported on the 14th Party Congress, as China began to experiment with capitalism. 
The new catchphrase is socialism with Chinese characteristics. In the new spirit of openness and economic reform, anything seems to go. Anything, that is, but political reform. 25 years on, the faces behind me have changed, but the backdrop remains pretty much the same. And the prospect of political reform as remote now as it was then. The Congress will now meet in secret for the next seven days, after which China's new leaders will be unveiled. President Xi is assured of a second term, and this Congress seems set to cement his position as China's top leader for a lot longer. Adrian Brown, Al Jazeera, Beijing. The changing faces of the Chinese Communist Party and the ever so slightly aging face of our correspondent, Adrian Brown. Well, let's discuss the issues surrounding the Congress with our panel. In Beijing, we have Aina Tangen. He's a political and economic affairs analyst. Joining us on Skype from New Delhi, Jabin Jacob, a fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies. And in Washington, D.C., we have Isaac Stonefish, a senior fellow at the Asia Society's Center on U.S.-China Relations. Welcome to you all. Aina, I'm going to start with you because you are there where things have been happening uh, in Beijing. We heard the Chinese leader say that China had entered a new era. What will define this era? Well, quite frankly, a lot of the uh, kind of things that he listed in his uh, more than three hour uh, intense discourse, very solidly delivered, a quite a, uh, let us say, a, a difference from a, a Twitter tweeting other uh, major leader. But I mean, seriously, um, the, the things that will define China are its outward push how it deals with the Belt and Road Initiative. They also have challenges in North Korea, uh, South and East China Seas, and how to deal with just the sheer size of their growth. Uh, internally, they have issues that they have to uh, uh, address. But I think you saw w within the do uh, document that uh, he read, very clear signal as to why he wants his party, his comrades to rally around this, why sacrifice is needed, and why they uh, have to go along with this program. If I ask you, Jabin, what we mentioned earlier on, the economist saying that President Xi is now the most powerful man in the world, would you agree with that, number one? And number two, explain to us how he has got more power, perhaps, in the last five years in the Chinese political system than some of his predecessors. Well, I think uh, it's not quite as black and white as uh, that calling him the most powerful leader on the planet. Um, he certainly has become quite powerful within China. But uh, I think uh, uh, the events surrounding in the run up to the Congress, as well as, uh, you know, uh, the fact that uh, we do not have a very uh, clear picture yet of who the top uh, contenders are for the Politburo Standing Committee. I think a lot of these things are still, uh, you know, up in the air. Um, he has certainly become more powerful over the last five years by his very strong anti-corruption campaign. Uh, he has uh, reigned in the party's excesses. He has uh, maintained strong control over the military. He has somehow gotten the military on his side much more so than any of his predecessors. And I think he's done it because he sold uh, a line to the ordinary people as well as to the party cadre as well as to the military that he is out to change China, make China stronger, and his vision of making China stronger has buyers, especially at a time when the rest of the world, the United States especially, does not seem to be stepping up to the plate as far as leadership is concerned. So he's able to sell to the Chinese people that this is an opportunity that has arrived and China must take it. Isaac Stonefish in Washington, D.C. There are some that are saying that he's emerging as a transformational leader, perhaps like Chairman Mao or Deng Xiaoping. As you know, Chairman Mao established the communist state. Deng Xiaoping introduced economic reforms that transformed China. What is he going to be known for? I think it's good to insert a bit of hesitancy and skepticism. So from what we can see she is becoming a more and more powerful leader, but there's just so much we don't know. We don't know what his relationship is with other members of the Standing Committee. We think it's quite good, but all we have are 
the tea leaves that we can see from the outside. We think he has a good relationship with the men who run the military. That's also something we don't know. So if we stick with the assumption that we're making that she is a very powerful leader and transformative in the way that Mao and Deng were, some things we might be able to expect is a far more assertive push internationally. You know, Chinese leaders like to talk about how their country is a developing one, not a developed one. We could actually see under Xi China going and potentially getting involved in conflicts or peace talks in the Middle East. We could see a more assertive Chinese stance on North Korea, we could see more assertive Chinese stance on the disputed islands in the South China Sea and on border issues with India. So there's a lot of different areas that Xi and China might decide to put a bigger push into. Aina, recent Chinese leaders have done 10 years. They've had the party congress where they got given the job. They had the halfway mark at five years. And then the next congress in 10 years, that was when they stepped down. Do you think President Xi is going to step down next time around in 2022? Well, uh, that's one of the big questions that's around this. Uh, a lot will depend on whether he brings in the next uh, two people from the sixth generation who would be capable of serving a five-year apprenticeship on the standing committee and then be able to take over. Obviously, the uh, corruption charges against the former uh, party secretary of Chongqing has made it uh, clear that he's out of the running. The uh, question is, can you bring up somebody quickly enough that people are going to be comfortable with? In terms of himself, I think he has a very ambitious agenda. I think we all agree on that. And he's trying, uh, he's trying to push it through. Will it take 10 more years? I'm not certain. But it'll, it, it will be in the cards. But one of the things that I, I think we, we are concentrating too much on is, we, you know, this China is a completely different entity. This is not something where you start putting your political and economic norms from your own country in the West and trying to insert them in China. The fact is, China does not do um, new plans on the back of a napkin as part of a campaign to get power. It is a very slow planning process that involves a lot of steps along the way. And this is how they achieve a lot of what they've done. So this idea that you can concentrate solely on what she is doing or who is on the top standing committee, uh, I think is uh, misleading. I think that the most important part will be the work a report which will indicate in detail what the government is, is trying to do and what emphasis it's placing on each part. I know you're telling me we're focusing too much on the leader. I am going to ask another question about the leader to jump in, though, which is about President Xi's background and how, what, in what way you think it shapes him. Because he was uh, from an elite family, son of an elite official, who then was purged and imprisoned and is in his youth sent to a rural area of China working as a farm laborer. How do you think that shapes his political outlook? Um, look, everyone's background is important to how they uh, think about politics. And I, I'm sure uh, this experience that uh, Xi's father went through in the Cultural Revolution has also affected and shaped Xi, except that, um, you know, uh, it might not be in quite the way that we think. I think one appreciation that she might have developed is in the power of the state, uh, in the power of the Communist Party uh, to keep things in order, uh, or the need for the Communist Party to keep things in order. So I think uh, to that extent, uh, she does not seem to have uh, any democratizing uh, tendencies. He seems to think that the Communist Party is absolutely essential for uh, China's rise. And, um, you know, so from that point of view, I think um, uh, that experience has taught him that what China needs is a strong hand uh, and clear direction, and somebody has to give that direction. And that is what I think he's trying to achieve uh, you in his... Uh, you, talk about uh, his uh, you talk about his strong hand, and one of the things he's done uh, in his five years is a widespread crackdown on corruption. But he still says in his speech today, it's a big problem in the country. Corruption is the biggest threat faced by our party. We can only get out of the historical cycle and ensure the long-term stability of our party and our country if we persevere in the continuous fight against corruption to ensure that our government, its officials and policies are clean. 
Isaac Stonefish in Washington, D.C. He says this continues. This fight against corruption, does this help him politically too? Because one assumes you're cracking down on corruption. People are somewhat fearful of you. I think depending on how well he plays it. On the one hand, corruption is something that's very unpopular in China. There's a lot of frustration you have among a lot of people that local leaders or even national leaders are corrupt and not steering the country in the right direction. I think the question is how much anger Xi Jinping builds among members of the party state for you know, turning off the spigot and because he's doing this in somewhat of a hypocritical way. You know, the, pro the leaders that he takes down are corrupt, if, if we believe the evidence against them, which mostly comes from the party, which is not an entirely trustworthy organization. Uh, and they also all have run afoul of Xi Jinping. So it, it's not a sort of honest, clean hands, we're just going after corrupt officials. It's going after corrupt officials who, for the most part, tend to be in some ways in opposition to Xi Jinping. I know Tangan in Beijing, moving from corruption to the wider economy, what are the biggest risks facing the Chinese leadership over the next five years? Well, if you're talking internally, a, a lot of it goes around uh, how to manage the economy. But once again, this is not a, a cookie cutter Western uh, democracy. Uh, the Chinese government has direct control over uh, almost everything. So what you see is this kind of uh, feeling the stones while ca crossing the river approach. They try something. If it works, they continue. If it doesn't, uh, they abandon it and find something new. This is not something you can do. You know, if you look at the West trying to steer its economies through central banks, which is kind of trying to, uh, you know, cut a wheat field with a, a razor blade, uh, versus China, who's able to literally say, this is where it's going to stop. We're going to close down these factories. We're going to move them. Things. Now, you might not like the system, but it is a part of the DNA of China that the people here expect the government to deliver some sort of uh, decent uh, living standards. And so far, China has done that. And I think they're going to continue. In terms of corruption, I'm, I'm not so certain that uh, my American colleague is entirely correct. If you start looking at the number of officials who have actually been taken down, some of them received uh, rises under Xi himself. And he has shown that he has, has a pretty even hand if he discovers that somebody has broken the rule. He told people five years ago that you, this is a new start. Everything that happened in the past is the past. Anything that happens forward is a direct affront to not only uh, the people, but to the party, and you will be taken down. Um, I don't know that I, I like this idea that we continually sing the song that China should do something about corruption. And then when it does, we say, oh, it's only for power reasons. Jabin, Aina keeps telling me not to look at China through Western eyes. I am going to ask you to challenge an assumption, though, from me, a Westerner, and that is that when you get greater wealth and education, the people will start asking for more freedom, freedom of speech, democracy and the like. Uh, do you see any sign of that, and is that a challenge for President Xi and the leadership? Well, if there is a sign of it, then it is very much under control. The Communist Party of China has managed to keep it under the lid. It's certainly not uh, uh, playing a, a role significant enough to change the course or the direction that she seems to have set for the Communist Party of China. And I think we just have to accept facts as they are. Uh, and I would agree with Aina in saying that, you know, this is uh, not a country that one can view with a West, Western lens, or even from an Indian lens. In fact, if I might say so, I think it's easier for us to, in India to understand what's going on in China, because some of the problems that uh, we see in China, we also face. Some of these same issues of anti-corruption are also big issues here. And we see the difficulty of actually dealing with these problems in a country uh, the, size, uh, the size that India and China are. So I think, yes, uh, there is a case to be made for uh, understanding and accepting that there is a separate Chinese or different Chinese DNA about how they will handle these issues. Isaac, the one Westerner who is probably grappling most uh, with how to understand China and President Xi is President Trump. And they seem to have surprised people uh, earlier on this year at Mar-a-Lago when they met in April and got on a lot better 
than we might have predicted from President Trump's election campaign. How do you see the relationship continuing, particularly as President Trump in a matter of weeks will be going to Beijing? Just one point on what my colleague in, in Beijing has said. I, I think a lot of us make the mistake inside China and outside of conflating the Communist Party and China the country. They are not the same thing. The party wants to have this idea of inevitability that, oh, China can only be ruled by the Communist Party. Obviously, that's not true. Thousands of years of history before the Communist Party, and there'll be thousands of years of history after. You also have Taiwan, democratically run, which China says is part of China, part of the DNA, but as a democratic polity. So I think you've we just had, have to be careful You've had your rebuttal there. Assuming... You've had your rebuttal there, Isaac. Now answer the question. Sure. The Trump... Uh, Xi relationship yes. going so, forward, and particularly the important visit of the president to Asia. So I, I think what Trump has been trying to do is to use North Korea as somewhat of an excuse to increase trade tensions with China. Trump has this very fanciful idea that uh, a trade deficit is very harmful to the U.S. economy, and he wants to rebalance trade between the U.S. and China. Uh, basically, every credible economist doesn't think this is a problem. Uh, Trump does. So I think even though he's going there in early November and the two leaders got along seemingly pretty well when they met in April, I do think Trump would like to have excuses to raise trade tensions between the two countries. I know there was, it seems, a deal. This very transactional US president said, I'll put all my concerns about trade on one side if you sort North Korea. It seems the US administration doesn't feel that it's got its end of the bargain. Well, quite frankly, that was not the bargain. This is, um, I think, a way that Donald Trump has been trying to portray it, so that anything that happens that is being pushed is, in cor of course, the fault of China. Uh, I think it's a, perhaps a clever PR move, but it doesn't reflect reality. The situation is that there's a trust deficit between uh, the U.S. and uh, North Korea because of what happened in uh, Libya and uh, other places where people were, uh, despotic leaders, quote, were defanged and then actually killed. So in that part of the things, I don't know that North Korea and the United States can sit down across the table and strike a deal. So I, I don't know that that's necessarily China's fault. In terms of the trade issue that is always harped on, that China is concerned about a, um, you know, a regime change, messily, that something bad happens and you start having, China starts inheriting all the problems. Remember, there won't be many refugees moving from North Korea into Alaska or anywhere else in the United States if things fall apart. So this, the, these issues are pretty complicated, but it's clear that, you know, you cannot just say it's one side's fault. If there's no talk, no trust, there will be no resolution. Okay, I know. Something let me just, not, I know, let me just ask wants. you this um, follow-up question. How much influence do you believe Beijing has over North Korea? Could they change North Korea's behavior if they wanted to? Not really. If you think back, every time that Xi Jinping has been near an international microphone, for some reason, this is the perfect time to fire off a missile or explode a nuclear bomb. You can just check that and you'll see that that is the case. Xi has, is a very controlled person. He does not react to Donald Trump. He does not react to Kim even though these are open provocations. The Chinese people are not happy about it. The Chinese government is not happy about it. Face is an important issue here. And Young Kim seems to delight in, in making sure he puts Xi's face in the mud every opportunity he can. Okay, so that is in okay, fact Isaac, I saw you shaking your head a bit there. Very quickly, your view on that. I think China as we, we all agree, is one of the world's most powerful countries. And if China were to decide that it wanted to push regime change in North Korea, or if it wanted to get Kim to stop with its missile tests, it has the ability to do so. Again, massive country. North Korea has always been in its sphere of, interest, uh, of influence. China just doesn't want to do that because it doesn't want the costs that would be associated with pushing 
North Korea to change. But I, I don't think we want to just blindly swallow the party line that China doesn't have any sway over North Korea or that this is an issue just between the United States and North Korea. China is a very important partner in everything involving North Korea. Jabin, quickly from you, a last thought on that. How much is the issue of North Korea going to dominate now uh, for the foreseeable future US-China relations? Well, let me take a middle path on this. I think China is not without influence on the North Koreans. And at the same time, I think the uh, North Koreans also know just how much to do uh, to stay under the red line as far as China is concerned. I think um, the North Korean Communist Party has actually congratulated Xi uh, on this uh, particular Congress. So I, uh, there is a limit to which uh, North Korea will go, uh, will, will stay under. And um, I also don't see at the same time that uh, for all the reasons that, uh, that were mentioned in the beginning, that because of the trust deficit between North Korea and the United States, uh, that the North Koreans will seize their provocations. Uh, the Chinese certainly don't want American troops on their borders. They certainly don't want the North Korean regime to collapse. So as important as space might be, uh, the North Korean regime's survival is uh, just as important a uh, national security consideration for the Chinese. Uh, okay. And I don't, Jabin, I just think... Jabin, thank you very much. Thank you to all our guests, Aina Tangin, Jabin Jacob and Isaac Stonefish.